from inside the WAER studios. Long outlet pass, Ryan Simmons inside! He scores the game winner! Give the assist to Don Madonna! Syracuse wins! Finds Garrier, open, drives baseline, goes up, and hammers it home! Quincy Garrier, hello! And it's intercepted! Andre Sisko! Flings it from 75 feet past the scoreboard, and he connected! Elijah Hughes throws up a prayer at the buzzer! And somehow it's answered. It's the Ostrom Avenue Podcast. The Orange. Take the Camping World Bowl. Syracuse gets the program signature win it always needed. Perhaps the biggest upset in program history. Taj Harris passed the 45. He's passed midfield. 30, 25, 20, 15, 10, 5. Touchdown, Syracuse. And one, Joe Girard. Three ball, Buddy Bayhive. He got all three of them. Huge shot from Buddy, pass point, Black got it! Game winner! Brendan Curry with the winner! Hughes left wing charges and slams with the right hand! Killing a three at the buzzer! Oh, it's good! He it. it! And here's your hosts, Owen Valentine and Ben Shulman. Welcome into the Ostrom Avenue podcast. It's time for football. Alongside Johnny Gadamowitz, I'm Ben Schulman. Make sure to check us out on social media at Ostrom Avenue Pod on Twitter. And we are joined today by a very special guest from Syracuse Sports Illustrated, Mike McAllister. Mike, thank you so much for taking the time. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. How are you doing today? How is the uh, the tune up to the season been? It's nice to be talking about football again. Uh, I think it'll be fun to have fans in the crowd again. Um, for that reason, I'm kind of looking forward to week two more than week one, just to be back in the dome with uh, Syracuse fans and feeling that atmosphere again. But um, regardless, it's, you know, it's, it's always hopeful at the beginning of the season and, and it'll be interesting. I think it's going to be a very critical year for Syracuse football in the direction of the program. So, you know, I'm excited to see how it plays out. You said fans back in the stands. That hasn't happened, but we did have media back at the preseason and we got some access there. So what, what sticks to mind first off when I talk about training camp? Well, the fact that they're um, very good at stretching, we got to see that quite a bit of that. So that was fantastic. Um, But, you know, I think the team seems to be in pretty good spirits. You know, the, the first 10 to 15 minutes of practice, which you're able to see, you're not going to see a ton in terms of who's ahead of who in personnel groupings, who's going to start. And a lot of, a lot of that stuff, you're not going to be able to see, but you can see how players interact with each other. Um, There was a comment by Dino Babers. He thought this year's team was closer than last year's. I think you could see some of that throughout training camp. Um, You know, I, I think it was nice to see that you didn't have to have a fullback at offensive line. Um, You know, so they've, they've had a couple of guys that were limited and things of that nature, but nothing catastrophic, which is good. And then you had a really intriguing quarterback battle. And I thought, you know, both guys from the little bit that we saw looked comfortable, confident, and, you know, ready to go if their, if their numbers called. So uh, I think a lot of good things, a lot of positive things and getting out of training camp without, you know, losing multiple starters to injury as they did last year is a big positive. Mike, you mentioned that quarterback battle, the, the sort of general consensus at the moment seems as if it's Tommy's job to lose, obviously, the, the more tenured veteran, I guess you could say. But just how long do you think that leash really is? I mean, as we're a week out from non-conference play, is this the sort of thing where if week one against Ohio, it, he doesn't have it going, should, should we expect to see Garrett Schrader week one? Or is that something that is a, a little more a long-term project for Coach Babers? I think you're going to see Garrett regardless of whether DeVito's playing well or not. Now, I say that with a small caveat. If DeVito comes out and completes, you know, 12 straight passes, leads two straight touchdown drives to start the game, then is Dino going to turn to Garrett Schrader and on drive three? You know, I, I don't think so. But that doesn't mean that in the middle of a drive that DeVito is orchestrating, he might not bring Garrett out for a couple of plays in certain formations, certain, you know, situations. Because of his athleticism, his ability to be a playmaker, you can do some things with him, especially running the ball. Uh, but, you know, I think you're going to see him on the field at some point in week one, regardless of how Tommy plays and, you know, to the short leash point, it's, it's a a benefit to Syracuse that if Tommy does start to struggle, as we've seen him struggle the last couple of years uh, at different points, and a lot of that can be pointed to the offensive line. So, you know, there is a, a reasonable excuse there from his perspective, 
But if he starts to do some of those same things when the offensive line is performing better, then you've got a guy that you can turn to where you don't feel like, you know, you're going to a Rex Culpepper and that completely changes your offense and you have to shrink the playbook because he's not able to do certain things or to a true freshman who maybe doesn't know the complete playbook. So you really have to shrink it and keep things very vanilla because he's just not there yet from an experience and a knowledge standpoint. So the fact that you've got a guy with SEC starting experience who has now been through the spring and the fall um, with, with your program, he should be pretty well uh, ready to go. So I think there is a little bit of that short leash that, that's going to be sort of hovering over uh, how Tommy plays. But um, I think regardless, as I mentioned, you're going to see Schrader on the field a little bit here and there in week one. Do you think that Schrader and DeVito could be on the field at the same time for this football team? You know, I've thought about that. Um, Babers hasn't mentioned that. But again, why would he if you're going to throw a, a wrinkle out there? But, you know, it's it's interesting because there are things that you can do. He played a little bit of wide receiver last year at Mississippi State when, when they tried to move him around uh, when Mike Leach didn't think that he was a fit for them at quarterback. So could you line him up as a wide receiver, throw a backwards pass to him and then have him throw the ball down the field? You know, you, you could be creative with some things like that. I think that's probably something that you don't show against Ohio, but maybe – you know, against Clemson, you throw a wrinkle out there to try to catch them off guard with a surprise play because, you know, against Clemson, you're overmatched. And so sometimes you need plays like that to, to keep you in the game or, or to pull off an upset against Ohio. To be, Ohio's a good team. They've won. They've had a winning season eight years in a row, 10 years in a row, something like that, whatever it is. And they've been to a bunch of bowl games. They're, they're a good team. They're not a power five team, but, but they're a quality team. Syracuse can go there, play well and still lose. But if you're a power five team going to play at a Mac school, you should go in expecting to win. Um, so I don't think you need to pull out those gadget plays. Uh, that doesn't mean they couldn't, but I think it's more likely in a game like at Virginia Tech or Clemson at home, uh, even Liberty at home, Liberty is going to be ranked this year. Those seem to be more of a spot where you could see something like that. You mentioned that, you know, the experience argument that, that I guess Tommy has going for him that Garrett doesn't. To what extent can that argument really be made? I mean, you're coming off of a COVID year, the ever-changing landscape that is college football with, with transfers and, and whatnot, plenty of injuries that we know about last year. How much weight does that experience argument really carry for number 13? Well, the, the counter to that is the experience that he had wasn't great for, for the most part. You know, when he was a, a freshman and he relieved Eric Dungy a little bit, those experiences were overwhelmingly positive. And that's, I think, why a lot of fans were encouraged about the direction of the program after Dungy, you know, left. But um, he's been behind a, a, an offensive line that's been one of, if not the worst in, in FBS football. And, you know, I think that's hurt him in terms of his development, his, his uh, ability to make plays, his ability to sit back and feel comfortable enough to read the defense. And so, you know, there's an argument to be made that the experience he had is so negative that you almost don't want to count that. But, you know, the, the part of the experience I think that does matter is running the offense in live game situations, this offense. And Garrett Schrader has experience starting and playing against the SEC, but he doesn't have experience starting and running the Syracuse offense. Tommy DeVito does for, for two plus seasons. So I do think that that is a factor that's to his benefit, but where he's got a what he has to do to take his next step is take that knowledge, that experience, and all of those, uh, you know, knowledge of the playbook and such that he is able to use to be successful in practice and turn that into success in live games on Saturdays. Moving still in the backfield, but away from quarterback, the running back position on this team, I, I think is going to be really interesting this year. You have Tucker from last year, where obviously – he really was phenomenal, surprised a lot of people with his freshman production. And then you have Abdul Adams and Jarvion Howard returning. You have Huff coming in as well. It kind of feels like a game of musical chairs to get carries in this offense. How did you feel the guys looked in training camp and, and where they shook out in terms of a depth chart? I think the guy that people aren't talking enough about is Cooper Lutz. Um, he was he ran for 100 yards against Notre Dame at the end of last year. Everything that we've heard and we've seen from training camp this year is he looks very good, very comfortable, quick, 
Um, I think he's got a real shot to end up actually being the primary backup to Sean Tucker. I think most thought it would be Abdul Adams or Jarvie on Howard taking that heart and Howard has looked pretty good this training camp as well. Um, Huff is unfortunately seems like he's, he's dinged up a little bit. So we don't know what his availability is going to be, but as you mentioned, they've got four legitimate guys that they could hand the ball off to and feel pretty comfortable with, you know, Howard and Abdul Adams both have experience here. Um, Lutz and Tucker obviously gained a lot of experience last year. So um, they've got a lot of, a lot of talent there, a lot of experience there. And I think they've got the ability to, um, if the offensive line can even be an average run blocking offensive line, I think they've got the chance to be a pretty good running team. What kind of stuff did Dino Baber say about the backs during camp? <clears throat> he said the same thing, basically, that it's one of their best groups, if not their best group. Um, Sean Tucker has been pretty impressive. Um, and, you know, he's he's gone out of his way a couple of times to mention Cooper Lutz. Um, but then he's also said that it's it's been a, a big positive to have Jarvion Howard and Abdul Adams both back there and, and has really – helped push Tucker and Lutz and, and that competition between those four guys has been um, really strong, really positive for the team. So I, I think all four are going to see the field at different times. So it'll be interesting to see how they, how they devy up the, the carries. I think it, the, the, the favorite to, to get the most should obviously be Tucker, but how they divvy it up behind that will be interesting to see. All right. So that's the ground game from an aerial attack standpoint. Obviously, you know what you're getting in Taj Harris outside of him. Who is impressed so far in camp? Is there a guy that has really stepped up and become that secondary pass catcher, whether it's an Anthony Queeley, Luke Benson, perhaps if the tight ends get more involved this season, who, who stood out from a camp standpoint on that end? Uh, throw the ball to the tight end. I think Syracuse fans uh, across the country have been clamoring for that where they didn't target that position much at all last season. And it was a little bit baffling, especially when you're rotating quarterbacks, they played three or four different quarterbacks last year. And usually the tight end is a quarterback's best friend in that scenario. And they didn't seem to use the tight end very much. And despite the fact that they've got, they had Aaron Hackett last year, and Luke Benson that we've seen show some flashes of being a good receiving tight end, didn't utilize him very much. So I think they've got an opportunity to utilize him. Uh, I do think Anthony Queeley is probably a guy that's going to be your number two option, but um, two guys that I would pay attention to that I've heard good things about in training camp. One is Damian Alford, who was a, a freshman last year. He's about six, five, six, six played high school ball in Florida, originally from Canada, freak athlete. Don't be surprised if they use him in, in red zone situations or jump ball situations quite a bit. He's, he's someone I think that has tremendous amount of potential to be, one of the better receivers in the ACC by the time his career is over. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if he saw the field quite a bit. Courtney Jackson, the, the slot receiver who's, um, you know, played a little bit last year, but uh, was kind of waiting in the wings behind Nike and Johnson. He has the potential to step up and be the starting slot receiver this year. And, and Sherrod Johnson, who's a veteran, played a little bit inside, played a little bit outside, doesn't get talked about all that much, but he's run, quite a bit with the ones from what we've seen. So I think there's, there's potential that he could be involved in the rotation, but um, even still Todd Harris is going to be the clear cut. Number one guy. I think Queely is probably going to be your compliment to him, more of the possession receiver type of guy that, that you look for. And then, you know, everyone else will get their, their shots here and there. You got me with the, uh, with the Damian Alford Canadian reference. I, uh, I know <laughs> you don't know this about me, but I happen to be from there. So uh <laughs> Take an Alford reference every day. He's good. Uh, man. Talking about, about Taj, he looks good. I mean, I'm I'm very uh, I'm very excited to see Alford. I, I'm interested in Taj. You know, kind of being the leader of this receiver room at this point. You know, he he was the number one guy last year on the field, but he still had Nikeem, a guy who was older than him and had been with him on the team when he was a freshman. There, what was Taj's demeanor like? at practices where he's kind of the vet giving knowledge to all the younger guys. Yeah, I know his demeanor last year was discussed quite a bit in terms of, um, you know, how he was on the field after plays, very animated, very emotional, um, you know, some gestures he made on the sideline at, at different games and things like that. But um, he, he hasn't really acted. Now it's practice. It's not a game. And I know it's usually a game when he gets, you know, that emotional, but um, he, he seems to have taken on a little bit more of a leadership role, you know, talking to some of the younger receivers and, and things of that nature from, from what we were able to see. But 
Uh, the one thing that's never changed is even when there were some, you know, in the fan base that were not overly pleased with, you know, the way he was acting either on the field or off the field, that his teammates never had an issue with him. You know, they, they were they were always supportive of him. There was never an issue in the locker room with him. Um, and, and so I think, you know, it's one of those things that as he continues his career and gets more mature and, and starts to learn how to channel that, he can take that energy and, and that emotion and use that to take his game to an even higher level. We know he's really good. He's going to be a focal point of the receiving group. Uh, but I think there's, there's reason to believe that he's going to take a step forward in terms of uh, his maturity and his leadership. Do you think his goal this year, or, well, I'm sure it is. Do you think it's a realistic goal this year that Taj Harris could end up getting drafted to the national football league? Yeah, absolutely. You know, if he, Syracuse has, has shown that if you have a big year as a number one receiver in this offense, you'll have a shot to play in the NFL. Everyone thought that Tristan Jackson, when he left a year early, um, you know, a year earlier than everyone thought that he left, as I mentioned, a year too early and that he wasn't going to have a chance in the NFL. And he's on the Rams roster and is looking to make it for the second year in a row, despite the fact that he was not drafted. So, uh, you know, Jamal Custis had a shot in the league. Uh, Steve Ishmael had a shot in the league. Uh, Amba Adetabo had a shot. So uh, I think whether he's drafted or not it is partially going to depend on how productive he is this season. But I think he's going to be in a training camp regardless. And it's because of his ability to make plays after the catch. I know that we've seen him a little bit as a punt returner um, at times during training camp and during fan fest and, and things like that. So if he can add that to his game, that's, that makes him even more valuable. If you can use him as, you know, a slot receiver or third or fourth receiver, but also as, as your primary punt returner, that, that makes him, uh, you know, that much more intriguing as a draft prospect, but you know, if, if he can cut down on, on some of the, those, you know, emotional outbursts and um, you know, we saw a little bit of last year, and, you know, he can continue to be productive. And we've seen each year he's gotten more productive year after year. He puts up a thousand yard season. Yeah, I think he's going to be on the radar to get drafted. Passing game, running game, none of it flows without strong offensive line play and Syracuse bringing back really essentially everybody obviously banged up in in previous years. But now the hope that this unit can really gel and stick together realistically, is there hope for drastic improvement if health can, you know, not be too much of a concern? Or at this point, is that just kind of what you're getting from an offensive line standpoint, even if everybody does stay healthy, perhaps some subpar play here and there? Hope springs eternal in the offseason. So, of course, going into the season, I think there's there's hope and health is the main reason. The fact that you didn't have both of the guys that you thought were going to be your starting guards, um, you didn't have either of them for, for most of the season. Dakota Davis and Chris Bleich now should be able to step in there. You've got some more depth at different positions with, you know, bringing junior college guy um, and, and Jacob Bradford. So, you know, you've got some options there and they've got some, some young guys uh, that have been Kalen Ellis, for example, as, as a guard, who's been very impressive as a true freshman. Um, Enrique Cruz was uh, their highest rated player that's that's coming in um, to, to this class. So, you know, it, he's an offensive tackle that, that could step in if you really needed him to, was rated four stars on some recruiting services. Um, so, you know, they've, they've got, I think, more depth. They're more able to absorb an injury or two if they absolutely had to than they were last year. But, you know, if all things considered, they started to play better towards the end of last year as some of those guys came back. When Dakota Davis came back and was able to fill back in for Chris Elmore, they played a little bit better. So now you've got a new offensive line coach, you've got more depth, and you're healthy. All of those things should mean that your offensive line plays better. That doesn't mean they're going to be a top 10 offensive line in the country, but you just need them to basically be average. If they can be average, I think everything else is in place to make you a team that should be in bowl contention towards the end of the year. Enrique Cruz Jr. actually was a, a guest of the Ostrom Avenue podcast recently. And, and I can tell you that kid, I, I don't know if it's going to be this year. I don't even know if it's going to be in football, but he's going to be a star somehow. He has got quite the personality and he is just an, an awesome person to talk to. Yes. Yes, Looking he is. I mean, I, there's... Listen, I, I like talking to these guys a lot um, during the recruiting process because you learn some of the personalities. And he's one that, you know, from the first time I did an interview with him, um, there's just you talk about that it factor. He's he certainly has that. 
And, and so he's, he's an easy guy to root for. And uh, I think with his personality, the more Syracuse fans get to know him, uh, um, you know, the more they're going to hope that he's successful on the field for him. Let's flip it around to the defensive side of the ball uh, and look at the line as well. You return Josh Black, Kingsley Jonathan, who's, you know, filling in around them that's going to help bolster the line. Yeah, I think Caleb Okachuku is a guy that I would keep an eye on. He's someone that, that they really like um, from um, – came in a couple years ago as a recruit, pretty highly touted recruit. He can play a little bit inside, a little bit outside. Um, I think Curtis Harper has a good chance on the interior to be a, a quality reserve behind McKinley Williams. Um, and then, you know, the, there's an incoming freshman who I like quite a bit, Jatias Gear from, from uh, down in the South. He's – a little bit under hyped, I think, but he's so good in terms of his athleticism, his first step out of his stance that um, everything that I heard is that the expectation is that he's going to play some snaps this year. So um, those are, are some of the guys that I would keep an eye on. Um, but having those two veterans back, you know, fifth year, six year guys, I think is, is huge for not only the defensive line, but just the leadership on the defense um, in totality. From a secondary standpoint, you mentioned the defensive line, obviously Garrett Williams. Beyond that, a couple returners as well. Anyone in camp making big strides, shooting their way up the depth chart as far as the secondary is concerned? Yeah, Deuce Chestnut, true freshman, uh, highest rated defensive prospect that signed with Syracuse at the most recent recruiting class. Uh, he's, I expect him to be the starter opposite Garrett Williams uh, right away against Ohio. He's was the number one cornerback in New Jersey in the 2021 recruiting class. Uh, really, really good player. Has an option opportunity to also be a contributor on special teams as a punt returner, potentially, um, if not this year, then, then down the road. Um, and then, you know, they brought in a guy, Jason Simmons, as a transfer. He and Ben LaBrosse, um, another Canadian, have uh, really been fighting for one of those starting safety spots. And regardless of who wins that, that spot, I think it's going to be Simmons. Both of those guys are going to play. Um, they're going to play quite a bit. And so uh, the safety depth is is very impressive, I think. You've got those two guys. You've still got Jahat Carter. Uh, you've still got Robert Hanna. Those two have been extremely impressive during camp. So, um, you know, I, I think their secondary is loaded. I, I think it, it might be the best unit on the team. And I think it's got the most NFL potential on the team as well. It feels like safety and punter or secondary and punter. That always <laughs> seems to be the – the NFL unit on Syracuse filling in for, you know, those NFL guys, Garrett Williams is kind of expected to be the guy for Syracuse this year. What have you seen from him at camp? Yeah, he's, he's stepped up in terms of his leadership. You know, last year it was Cisco and Trill Williams and even a little bit of, of iffy as kind of the guys that, that the younger guys turn to and look to and it's Garrett Williams now, and he's embraced that role. He's taken on that role, but he's, I mean, from just a physical standpoint, he's looked every bit the, you know, elite cover corner type that you saw play all of last year. Uh, doesn't look like he's taken any step backwards. Um, I think he's going to be one of the better corners in the ACC. He'll be in the mix for first team all ACC by the time the year is over. And, you know, he's, he's projected right now as being a first round draft pick next year uh, based on what he did last year, what his film showed and, and what his potential is to, to take a step forward this year and, and I think all that hype is legitimate it's it's well earned and he hasn't shown anything in training camp that would detract from that looking a little more big picture here obviously you hear it time and time again you got to take care of business against the non-conference portion of the schedule Syracuse obviously with four non-conference games before that ACC play gets going Mike in your opinion how many of those four games does Syracuse need to take in order to roll into ACC play, feeling good and feeling confident before you take on some of the big boys of the conference? I think you got to win at least two. You're going to beat Albany. Even if Syracuse is bad this year, they're going to beat Albany, right? So, so we feel pretty confident about that. Then you've got Liberty at home. Liberty's a ranked team. They're going to be expected to beat you. You've got Rutgers at home. Rutgers hasn't been good for a long time. Um, and neither has Syracuse, but the point is that uh, that's, a game against two teams that should be pretty well evenly matched you've got them at home it's a big game for recruiting both of those, those schools recruit some of the same players uh, in the northeast so you know that 
that's an important game. And then you've got the, the road game at Ohio. If you can beat Ohio and then you feel pretty good knowing you're going to beat Albany, now you feel like you've done your job in the non-conference, that you've hit the, the floor that you need to keep bowl holes realistically alive. If you could then somehow figure out a way to beat Rutgers, now you're three and one in preseason or in the non-conference, you feel even better, pull off an upset against Liberty, you're four and oh, and guess what? If you're four and oh, having beat a ranked team, you've got a chance to be ranked yourself. So there's several scenarios. If you're at one and three after those four, I think that's, that puts you in a really bad spot. It would be extremely difficult to make a bowl game in that, in that um, situation, in my opinion, if you're at least two and two, you keep everything alive and, and everything is out in front of you. Few remember when Syracuse was a ranked team playing Liberty uh, <laughs> in right. 2019, although that was a, a very, very brief stint in the top 25. Uh, you know, no one is necessarily expecting them to get back there this year, but you opened this episode by saying that you thought this was a really crucial year for the program. Why do you think that? Well, there's, there's a lot of um, negative chatter around the direction of the program under Dino Babers um, among the fan base. And when you have that, um, you know, it's, it's a tough sell, I think, to recruits and, and to the administration to say, hey, keep the guy around that the fan base has given up on. And so if you have another four and eight year, you would have been, you know, five years into the, the Dino Babers era and you would have had one winning season and four losing seasons. And it's understandable given the re- recent history of Syracuse football over the last decade plus, or even the last two decades, why it would feel like it's the same old, same old, you know, a little flash in the pan with the 10 win season, but everything else is basically the same as it's been for 20 years um, since coach P left. So, you know, you get back to a bowl game and suddenly it feels like the trajectory is back on the positive. You know, you, you had the 10 win season, you had a five and seven season the year after where you were replacing your quarterback and had all sorts of issues along the offensive line. You had the COVID year, which is kind of a throwaway year. Then you get back and you're healthy. And with that same quarterback that was supposed to be the next guy after Dungy got you back to a bowl game. Um, you know, especially if you win one or two big games in there somewhere, you're six and six, seven and five. Then I think people start to feel like, okay, things are back to where I thought that they should be. So I think it's really critical from that perspective. Um, I think it's important to be competitive, even in games that you lose. Um, you, you just, it, it's so important for fan support. It's important for recruiting. It's important for, um, you know, national perception of the program as well, because we know the last two years haven't gone well. And you look at every preseason prognostication on Syracuse and it's, are they even going to win an ACC game? you know, over under three wins for the whole season. No one is expecting Syracuse to do anything other than be really bad. If you want to change that perception, you have to start winning. And that starts with this season, in my opinion. If you're going to change that at any point under Dino Babers, I think uh, this is the year that you start doing that. I always, uh, I wonder what what the, the floor is for wins people will accept Dino Babers back with, because it's, I think it's kind of funny, you know, last season, you know, they weren't good. They won one football game, but they didn't play any non-conference. You know, they only won one more ACC football game than they did the prior year. So that, that, you know, an aside, but I always find that funny. Uh, Zooming back in on training camp, just to wrap it up a little bit. uh, What was the nicest single play you saw throughout camp when they were running against offense versus defense? Is there one play that just really pops out? So it actually wasn't, even a play that we saw live it was actually a play in one of the clips that um the Syracuse football Twitter account tweeted out they've got their little highlight package and their little clips and whatever um, that they tweet out from some of the closed portion of practice and it didn't show exactly who threw the ball but someone threw a deep pass and Deuce Chestnut who I mentioned earlier uh, the true freshman came flying in as he had made up some ground leaped into the air and and high pointed the ball and and, and took what should have been a touchdown and turned it into an interception. And it was impressive to see him uh, not only display that those kind of ball skills as a true freshman, uh, high pointing the ball and, and et cetera, but showing his makeup speed as well. And then, you know, just sort of the instincts to be a playmaker. Um, we, we know that Andre Cisco was fantastic at that. It just 
having that instinct of where the ball was going and reading and reacting and, and forcing turnovers, whether it was interception or, or a forced fumble. And that's one of the biggest things Syracuse has to worry about replacing this year that I thought was missing after Cisco went out um, was that, that leader, that playmaker, and as good as Garrett Williams is, I don't know that he's a, you know, four, five, six, seven interception type of guy that Andre Cisco was. Deuce Chestnut maybe can step into that role and be a little bit more of a playmaker. Um, and, and so to see that play as a true freshman, uh, I thought was, was extremely impressive. And that, that could have answered this question as well, but what was or who was your favorite story from all of training camp? Favorite story from all, I don't know whether he's going to win the, the starting um, or, the, or the backup running back spot, but I've, I've kind of always been intrigued by Jarvion Howard just because he's shown so much power as a runner early in his career. And he looked a lot quicker this year um, in training camp from what we saw. So I thought that was extremely intriguing, but um, I think the best story is Chris Bleich, the, the transfer offensive lineman from Florida, who the NCAA because none of their rulings ever make sense, declared him ineligible last year, even though they were basically handing out eligibility waivers to seemingly everyone except for him for some reason. And, you know, he, he fought through that. He battled through that, was extremely patient. It's been, you know, almost two years since he's played, um, you know, organized football. And so to see him, you know, back in, in training camp, and I know he's had some, um, limited periods, you know, to making sure that he's not hurt. But uh, I just think it's cool to see him out there and um, the fact that he's as amped up as he is to finally get back out there and play. You know, you like to see those kind of stories. Well, we can't wait to see him on the playing field after being at training camp. Mike, thank you so much for taking us inside uh, Syracuse football's preseason practices and letting us get a little bit of information about the team. Thanks, guys. I appreciate you having me on. Thanks so much, Mike. Appreciate it, as always. That does it for this episode of the Ostrom Avenue podcast. Thank you so much for tuning in. Make sure to check us out on social media, on Twitter. We're also on YouTube, where we post videos. If you're listening to just audio, if you're watching us on video, hey, you can check out the audio as well if you're on the go or in the car. We'll have episodes weekly throughout the seasons, and we might even have two this week before the opener at Ohio. WAER has that game at 7 p.m. Saturday with an hour-long countdown to kickoff starting at 6. So for Johnny Gadamowitz, I'm Ben Shulman saying thank you so much, and we'll talk to you next week.